If I were to ask you to name a video game set in the Wild West, I'd probably already know what to expect. I mean, Rockstar holds a pretty big monopoly over this genre in the gaming world, and for all the right reasons. Their most recent Red Dead Redemption 2 instantly became a classic, and has been praised by players all around the world for its absolutely gorgeous and lively world, remarkable attention to detail, and of course, a super engaging story featuring what many believe to be the best video game protagonist ever created. It is an incredible technological achievement and a fully fleshed out cowboy simulator. Come to think of it, what else do you really need? I think for the majority of people, it filled the western shaped hole that they've had for a very long time, and if they ever wanted some more, they can just hop back in and become a rootin' tootin' cowboy for a day if they really wanted to. So what else is there? What other game can at least partially fulfill the same urge to shoot at some bad guys with a revolver and have honorable duels with similarly skilled marksmen? I mean, there's always the original Red Dead Redemption and Red Dead Revolver, but both of those games are also made by Rockstar. There's Gun, but that game is like 20 years old. There's also these two, but they're more like fantasy games with a cowboy hat on top, and while giving a fresh feel to the genre, they kinda lack the authentic style and the grounded feel of that good old Wild West story, and that's about it, right? Well, what if I told you that there is another game, or should I say series, that maybe due to its name that sounds like it's a knockoff of Call of Duty or something, or due to it plainly being overshadowed by RDR, silently slipped into obscurity. That series is Call of Juarez. So without further ado, my name is Shadow, and today I wanted to talk a bit about the series history and explain what makes the series latest entry, Gunslinger, particularly great. 2004. The PlayStation 2 and the original Xbox were rivaling on the shelves of each store. First person shooters and action games in general, as always, were dominating the market. Call of Duty was quickly gaining popularity. Valve's Half-Life 2 continued to push the boundaries of what was possible in a video game at the time with its impressive physics system. GTA San Andreas won Game of the Year, which is hardly surprising to anyone. And a small Polish studio, which you may or may not recognize from one of my previous videos, revealed their newest project to the world, initially named Lawman. Techland, founded in 1991, had years of game dev experience under their belts, working on miscellaneous projects such as Chrome, a sci-fi shooter that was one of the first Polish action games released worldwide, and gained average reviews. So they were more than capable of creating a functioning first-person game, and seeing as the genre wasn't really taking advantage of the western theme, they decided to make their step forward. The game was initially just planned to be an arcade shooter, but during development they decided to give it a bigger emphasis on story, and with that came a name change, Call of War S. The game was published worldwide in 2006, notably by Ubisoft in North America. Its shooting mechanics were pretty great at the time and it featured two alternating protagonists which had different playstyles, one stealth based and the other action packed. It also had some minor interesting ideas packed into it like using a lasso, horse riding, concentration mode and of course Wild West style duels. It got mixed to average reviews, especially outside Europe, but the game was overall well enough received to spark an idea for a sequel, creating the Call of War as franchise. And so, the second the second game in the series, Bound in Blood, was released just three years later as a prequel to the events in the first game. It was not only a graphical improvement, but also an improvement in almost everything else. The game took the dual protagonist idea to the next level. Instead of having separate levels for each character, it lets you choose between two brothers that focus on different playstyles. Ray, one of the protagonists in the first game, was more aggressive, having the ability to dual wield pistols and a massive supply of dynamite, and Thomas, who was more altruistic, focusing on long range shooting, using the last so and having the ability to climb. And while this gave you more options on how you can tackle a level, this also limited you on how far you can go without having to leave your brother behind. The AI was also very janky, so your partner would often get in the way. And if you were playing as Ray, you'd have to wait like 5 years for Thomas to actually climb up a ledge and pull you up. Nevertheless, the idea of having two brothers that stuck with each other no matter what was strangely fitting in this genre. Which brings me to one of the best parts in the game, and that was the storytelling. What are you doing here? Do not violate the word of God, the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Well, it's a little late for that, little brother. Look around. In fact, it is still said to have the best story in the series by fans. The banter between the brothers is very satisfying, and seeing them deal with all their problems together while ultimately fighting against each other at the same time really made you feel anticipation on where the story would go. Even now, it's still very much worth experiencing. We are family. Oh! 
As for the gameplay, it was also one of the biggest improvements. Techland once again experimented on what they can do, and some things were a success. For example, the shooting was refined and leaned even more into the arcadey feel, which really benefited the game and the series in the long run. The concentration mode system was reworked and differed depending on which character you were using. The dueling system was great and paved the path for Gunslinger, and a dynamic cover system was also introduced, which let you lean on pretty much any piece of the environment and shoot while being fairly safe. Other things were not as great. For example, there were like two open world sections for some reason. They had like a couple of fetch quests you can do. I don't know what that was all about, honestly. Overall, the game was a lot more successful than its predecessor and has aged pretty well even to this day. Of course, this positive reception gave Techland the green light to continue the series, and their next game would go on to become genre-defining, a masterpiece by all meanings of the world. Hold on, is that what I said? No, 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 no. rewind. Call of Juarez the Cartel was an absolute disaster. For some reason, somebody at the studio thought that it would be a good idea to take their authentic western cowboy shooter and bring it into the modern day world. I mean, just by looking at the main menu, tell me you don't see anything wrong with this. I mean, how did we go from this to this in a span of one game out of nowhere? Alright, you get what I mean. In fairness, the game did have some similarities to its predecessors. For example, the characters also had different playstyles and cooperated with each other. Concentration mode was present as well, you could dual wield. And one of the main characters was supposed to be a descendant of Billy Candle from the first game. But the game itself was absolutely missing the charm of the Wild West, and what was left of it was just a generic shooter game with a generic story and generic gameplay. Without its distinct flair that was built up by the previous games, the game was just the worst version of other modern shooters. Unsurprisingly, the game received abysmal reviews and seemingly irreversibly damaged the reputation of the series. But that's not all. The game got into a controversy and was publicly spoken out against by the leaders of both El Paso and Juarez, accusing it of glorifying cartel violence and turning real suffering into entertainment, on top of some other sensitive topics. It got so bad that the CEO of Techland and the lead designer of the game himself said that the game was quote unquote a mistake. So as the dust settled, the game was delisted on Steam and other gaming platforms, and pirating it didn't even work properly, making the game almost impossible to obtain. Whether this was for good reason or not, I can't say, but one thing I'm certain of is that the series reputation was permanently scarred. The series faded away into obscurity and was never heard from again. Hold on, what did I just say? No, 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 that's not how the story went, rewind. Despite the disaster that was this game, somebody in the team was crazy enough to propose another entry in the series. And my god, that was the best decision they've ever made. Because the next game, Gunslinger, is awesome, so let's dive into why. The game begins as legendary bounty hunter and also our protagonist, Silas Greaves, arrives in a small town. He gets off his horse and enters a bar. As he sits down, he is greeted by the people sitting there, and when he reveals his identity, they look at him in shock. They have read all about this legendary gunslinger in their novels and old newspapers. Obviously curious as to what interesting information the man may share with them, they offer him a drink in exchange of a good story. He accepts, and with a bit more back and forth, the game suddenly throws you in a seemingly random level. During my first playthrough, when it finally got to me why the game did this, I was honestly amazed. I hadn't seen anything like it before. The level in question is a memory, a visualization of a story from Silas's past being told at the bar. The genius behind this type of storytelling is that you don't have to wait for the character to engage in any dialogue, disrupting you from the action. Huh? Instead, all the dialogue conveniently happens as you go, giving you some insight and entertaining you in those faint moments where you're not shooting at everything that moves. The right position is very important. Personally, I prefer to be on top. Oh, you do, do you? But that's not even the best part. In fact, the best part is even more genius. As you go along, one of the characters listening to Silas takes over the story, seemingly knowing how everything went down from what he had read about the events. He describes everything in great detail about how heroic Silas was as he killed his enemy in a fair duel, until Silas takes over again and says, No, boy, that ain't what I meant when I said I met Pat Garrett. So let me start again. I finally reach those damn stables. This time, for real. This happens numerous times throughout the game as Silas corrects, debunks, forgets, and then replaces parts of his story. Hold on, were you attacked by Apaches? W what happened to the cowboys? Did I say they were Apaches? And the game comically portrays these changes, rewinding, dropping objects out of the sky, and shaping the world around you. Also, certain actions that you do in the game often contribute to the dialogue. For example, killing a chicken on the first level will result in Silas saying this. After the fight, maybe we could treat ourselves to some fried chicken. 
Overall, this is one of the most unique ways of presenting a story I've ever seen in any game. It's a sudden yet welcome change from the linear, serious tone of the previous games that matches perfectly with the art style in the arcadey gameplay. Speaking of which, let's see what these two have to offer. Starting with the art style. While previous games focused on a more realistic and somewhat darker tone when it came to graphics, Gunslinger being a smaller, less serious project gave the developers more freedom when it came to expressing its style. The cutscenes all have this comic book feel to them, which I think is much better than the cinematic cutscenes, or the bland dialogue boxes that many other games use. While in the playable part of the game, the levels themselves, the game has this cell shaded vivid art style that once again just works. And of course, the most important part, the gameplay. Now while the first two games had some impressive mechanics for the time, there were a lot of annoyances when it came to quality of life and Gunslinger seems to have fixed pretty much all of them. First off, when it comes to animations, you can instantly see how smooth they feel, especially if you're playing it right after one of the previous games in the series, whether it would be running, shooting, aiming, reloading, climbing, etc. Killing enemies results in comically large spills of blood pouring out of them, which is incredibly satisfying. Explosions are vibrant and destructive, and the UI is the cherry on top. Also following this comic book style, letters and numbers pop but aren't overly intrusive. But the thing that impacts this game the most in terms of gameplay is all the features, because being the fourth entry in a series that already established a lot of unique traits to differentiate itself from other FPS games, requires a lot of thought and effort to think of something new to bring to the table, or at least build up on what was already introduced. And fortunately, this game sticks the landing on that as well, starting with one of the best parts in western shooters in general, concentration mode. In the first game, you did this by holstering both revolvers and right-clicking. This would slow down time, and two crosshairs would slowly shift from the corners of the screen to the middle until they connected back into one. It was a weird system, but very fun nonetheless. In Bound and Blood and the Cartel, these would fill into a simple bar, and when it was filled up to the max, you would unleash all your unspent fury. But in Gunslinger, they made a slight yet very important change. Instead of waiting for the bar to fill up, you can basically use concentration mode at any time, as long as you have the available amount. This makes gameplay very dynamic, since sometimes you just need a few seconds of concentration mode to finish off a few enemies, throw a dynamite and shoot at it in midair, or even shoot an incoming one. Just having the ability to spend what you have whenever you want is very comfortable. Since this game does not have a dynamic cover system like Bound in Blood, the developers found a different, even cooler alternative to this. There is a death awareness bar that has a short cooldown and when it's active you can literally dodge bullets. What else do you really even need here? You basically have a get out of jail free card when you're hurt since it gives you a few seconds to hide or escape to regenerate, and it looks fucking incredible as well. The best part is that the enemies actually react to your dodges. <laughs> The guns in this game are also fitting to the genre, and while there was some criticism towards the animations being unrealistic, my personal opinion is, well, they don't have to be. This game isn't trying to be a realistic tactical reload simulator, it's an arcade game. The faster you are, the better, even if this requires some compromises. Since you also have to be on the watch for all the millions of projectiles constantly flying at you, and standing there reloading each bullet for like 5 hours would drastically affect the experience. Just go play Stalker instead if you're looking for that kind of realism. And if you aren't picky about gun logic, then this won't really be a problem to you at all. There are a couple types of pistols and a normal slash sawed off version of a shotgun and rifle. Not that many weapons to choose from, but the game has a clever solution to this. It gives you three choices for your playstyle, gunslinger, ranger, and trapper. In the previous games, this was split between characters, so for example in Bound and Blood, Ray could dual wield and was more close range, and Thomas had a long range rifle. But since there is only one protagonist here, you don't have to choose, which is great. You can switch playstyles mid fight by swapping guns, and you have all skills available to you at any time once unlocked. Each of these playstyles have their own skill tree, which unlocks upgrades that suit your preferred playstyle and make your gameplay experience better. For example, the Gunslinger tree focuses on more agility based perks, Ranger focuses on precision, and the Trapper is all about dealing the biggest amount of damage. I've said what I think of skill trees in the past, but in this case, XP is earned by literally just shooting your enemies. No BS side quests or anything, more like a passive gain, and I'm fine with that. It gives you something to strive towards while enjoying the great gunplay. Also, at the end of each half of the upgrade tree, you unlock premium versions of guns that have better accuracy, damage, aim speed, and reduced recoil. One thing that this game is missing when it comes to gameplay is the freedom and the platforming elements. In the first and second game, there were these semi-open world sections, and the maps would overall be of bigger size. <laughs> Patches. Renegades, probably. Son of a bitch. <gasps>
sometimes big enough that you would have to use a horse to get around. There were also a lot of times where you would need to use the lasso or even climb up a literal mountain, but Gunslinger throws all this away and focuses mainly on the shooting, with some rare jumps and interactions in between, and the levels are entirely linear. And once again, I think this is yet another positive change. This game is supposed to be of smaller scale and it seems that Teclan finally understood what part of the gameplay they should be focusing on primarily. And finally, duels. The cherry on top of the franchise. They have come a long way from what was initially featured in the first game. It was a weird system that involved a lot of leaning, a 5 second countdown, and you had to physically pull your mouse down and up, mimicking the drawing action to shoot. Bound in Blood greatly improved on this system by putting you in a different perspective, making you reach for your gun while keeping your target in view. The cartel skipped them altogether, I think. And Gunslinger built top of the system of Bound and Blood. Instead of walking around, you have to center your view on the target while lowering your hand to increase speed. To win honorably, you have to draw right after your target, as drawing before gives you a dishonorable rating, which is pretty cool. These duels are a great way to handle boss fights in a game that doesn't have that much enemy variety, and while there are a few boss fights that involve shooting at a spongy target, I always look forward to the duels to finish off a level. Apart from the main story, this game also has an arcade mode that involves playing through all the levels casually in order to get a high score and earn stars. And if you enjoy dueling, there is also a dueling gauntlet that tests your awareness and reaction. This game also has collectibles, Nuggets of Truth, that feature random facts from the Wild West. As a completionist myself, this is almost always the annoying part when it comes to getting all achievements, because there are usually millions of these collectibles scattered around with bad indication on where to find them. It's usually just a mindless chore, but in this game, since the levels are not that big, they are pretty easy to scout out, and you get a notification when you're near them as well. Apart from that, the game has multiple difficulties and two different endings, and it's a pretty concise package when it comes to side content. Now in terms of story, I usually like to dive deep into the lore of the games that I make videos on, but this game's story is pretty much grounded. It's almost like hearing an older family member talk about their past and their weird encounters. There are a lot of historical and fictional figures that Silas teams up with or goes after. You get to know a bit about Silas's backstory and his motivations, and overall it's an entertaining bonus to the great gameplay. And since I already talked about the unique storytelling aspect, there isn't much left to say except go try it for yourself if you're interested, because that ending is very much worth sticking around for. And that's what makes Call of War as Gunslinger so awesome. What a ride this game series has been. I know I pretty much universally praise Gunslinger in this video, but if you're interested, do give the first two games a shot as well. They might be old, but the stories they tell are timeless. Anyway, as always, if you have any ideas for games that you want me to possibly review in the future, drop them in the suggestions box in the Discord server. The link is always in the description. If you enjoy video essays on miscellaneous games that I find interesting, make sure to subscribe and leave a like. You know what to do. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll see you guys later.